Thanks, everybody, for uh, letting us join with you again here today to talk about the future of this state. I think it's pretty clear, like a few years ago when we were talking about jobs, 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 today and in the coming days and weeks and months and years ahead, we're going to continue to talk about workforce, 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 because that's what I hear from employers all across the state, big and small alike. And so uh, today you've got a, a great uh, series of, of speakers. In fact, in a little bit, you're going to hear from some of the folks about the impact of Foxconn, which in and of itself needs uh, a workforce need. Part of uh, the reason why we're talking about what we're talking about today is not just to celebrate those 35,000 jobs, because it's really the 13,000 direct jobs and another up to 22,000 indirect jobs and induced jobs, the 10,000 construction jobs. They're going to talk all about that. But one of our goals is to make sure we not only fulfill the needs that they're going to have directly and indirectly there, but that we, we those are a net gain when it comes to jobs in the state and that we're not taking um, employees from other employers across the state. And so our goal here, then it's not just because of Foxconn, it's as I travel the state from one end of the state to the other, that's one of the challenges we hear about. It's a good challenge. You remember before we took office in the four years prior under my predecessor, we'd lost about 133,000 jobs in the state. Uh, the unemployment rate the beginning in uh, January of 2010 peaked out at about 9.2%. The month before we took office, it was 8.1%. Today it's 3.4%, and so uh, it's a dramatic change in terms of where we sit and where we need to go going forward. So I want to share a little bit with you on, uh, I think, there we go, on, uh, instead of seeing me, you'll get to actually see the screen up there, a little bit about our agenda for workforce going forward. So if I can use this electronics pretty well. First of all, just a moment or two, a little bit about highlighting where we're at as a state there. It looks like it actually pretty a pretty good view like I had the last two weekends. Unfortunately, I didn't get a deer. We were talking about this backstage. My son Matthew got one, so at least I was happy with that along the way. But if you look at the state overall, we're open for business. That's one of the things uh, that whether it's uh, WMC, the statewide chamber, our partners and others who are here today really helped us early on make sure that we changed the approach, even so much so that I was just thinking about this the other day when we were crossing the St. Croix River for some meetings. Uh, reminding myself again that uh, when we first came in, we took the signs off that said what the name of the government was and just put Wisconsin's open for business because we wanted to send a, a strong and positive message, not just symbolically, but in all that we've done. And, and you look, because of all of you here and so many that you represent across the state, not only through the policies in this capital, but because of you and employers in the state, we've changed the business climate. You know, you've heard it before, but we're proud to say that in the uh, few, few years before uh, we first took office in 2010 and 2009, years before that, Wisconsin, at least according to Chief Executive Magazine, ranked consistently in the bottom 10 states for business. We're obviously proud that this year, for the first time in the history of that ranking, Wisconsin is now a top 10 state, a top 10 state for business. We want to continue to grow that. We look at, as I mentioned, unemployment is not only down to 3.4% in many of our counties across the state, it's either at or near historic lows. Uh, and so we've got good news going on there, good investments, good things happening, but there's more to be done. We also think about the state in terms of what, why is it that we're, we're better for business? Well, it's changes in regulations and, and lawsuits and other th issues out there, but part of it's just changing the tax burden changing the cost of doing business in the state, uh, both for businesses as well as the cost of living for individuals. And I'm proud to tell you that through the end of this budget, the budget I signed at the end of the summer, the cumulative tax relief in the state of Wisconsin through the end, from the time we started in January of 2011 to the end of the budget, will exceed $8 billion. In fact, you think about that, next year at the end of 2018, there'll be lower income taxes, and lower property taxes in 2018 for a typical taxpayer than they were in January, or excuse me, in December of 2010. In fact, we've wiped out an entire tax for the first time since 1931. In a few weeks, when you get your property tax bill, there'll be no state property tax bill on your local property tax bill. That's gone. We eliminated the tax entirely. We eliminated that tax, the alternative minimum tax. There's a number of other things we're doing. We want to keep doing that. We've seen great progress along the way, and that's had a, a positive impact. In fact, you may not have seen it because it didn't get widely covered, uh, but a few months ago, and, and this is just through 2015, so it's gotten even better since then. But you remember for years, we heard about the rankings that Wisconsin was at in terms of state and local tax burden. Well, it used to be 20 years ago, we were in the top five. 10 years ago, we were in the top 10. 
I'm proud to tell you something you may not have heard about, but Wisconsin now ranks for state and local tax burden, state and local tax burden below the national average of all the states in the country. So we're heading in the right direction. Now, we're not done yet, so don't get worried thinking you think we're just satisfied with where we're at, but that's pretty good news because for years we heard about the challenges the state had, both for individuals and for employers when it came to taxes. So good things there, and certainly when we think about winning for this state, uh, a number of changes. We've, you may have heard, may not have heard, who knows, but for the sixth consecutive year in a row, we ended up the state fiscal year with a surplus. In fact, we had more than a half a billion dollar surplus. We now have a rainy day fund. It's 168 times bigger than we took office. And something that I used to think only actuaries and accountants could, could cheer about. But when I look at my neighbors to the south and realize the challenges they have with their pension and other unfunded liabilities, I'm really proud to tell you that for the first time since the 1970s, this year, three of the national bond rating agencies actually raised, improved the state of Wisconsin's bond rating. So that's a pretty good thing, just not only for fiscal impact, but increasingly, as businesses are coming north from places like Illinois, they realize there's a real difference out there. So we're, we're pleased to putting our fiscal house back in order as well. And then the big thing we want to talk about today, workforce. So over the last few years, we, this isn't something that just came to us recently because of being here at events like this and the talking to many of you at your places of employment across the state. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, into workforce development on top of what we already do in our schools and our technical colleges, our university system and our private colleges and universities. We've invested in things like Wisconsin Fast Forward and other initiatives we're going to talk about. But there's really more to be done because, you know, the challenge is and this is something that should be pretty apparent to any of you who are hiring or have, we're hiring or help wanted signs out front. But one of the things that I'm most proud of is also one of our biggest challenges. And that is in this state today, in fact, last month in October, we saw for the second month in a row, we broke the all time record, for the largest number of people in the labor force in the history of the state of Wisconsin. So that's really good news, unless you're hiring. Because as you all know, any of you who are hiring today or looking forward to hire, What's good news for people looking for work, the fact that there've never been more people in the workforce in the state of Wisconsin than they are today, that also means it's a challenge. And it's not just in one industry cluster. Uh, we see it in manufacturing for sure. We see it in transportation, in IT, in healthcare, in education, in law enforcement, in finance and accounting. We see it in a lot of core industry clusters across uh, the state of Wisconsin. And so part of what we want to talk about today it's how do we keep that going? We want to make sure it's, because I was just at a school the other day talking to sixth graders through 12th graders. I said, you all are in this great position. I remember when my sons, Matt and Alex are 12, or excuse me, 12, 22, it seems like they were 12 just yesterday, 22 and 23. And I remember back when they were in junior high, Tonette and I back then really kind of worried like a lot of parents our age. We worried that our kids because of the recession might graduate and not have a job for them. I mean, that seems pretty distance off there, but we, it wasn't that many years ago that we were worried as parents and just as society that, that the young people going through our schools and eventually our colleges and universities might get trained, might get an education, but not, might not have actually have work opportunities or at least opportunities to pursue their career options out there. Well, I tell these students the other day, as I tell students, as I think since February, I've been to almost 60 school districts across the state. And, and often I'll get a chance to talk to junior high and high school students. I tell them, you guys are in a great position. You're in the catbird seat. You, you got an opportunity to pursue any kind of career you want. Because if you do well in these key industry clusters, uh, you're gonna get hired and you're gonna get hired right away. And we want to keep you here in the state of Wisconsin. So we have a tremendous opportunity to do that, not just to raise up organically, uh, internally within the state, but to do some other things to bring some talent from outside of the borders of the state of Wisconsin to help us build the size of our workforce. Because it's not just the, uh, the highest amount we've ever had today. It's not just the fact that traditionally, week after week, we have almost 100,000 job openings on our state website, jobcenterwisconsin.com. It's the fact that many of you know in key industry clusters, whether it's in manufacturing, whether it's in healthcare or other areas where the median age is high, we know that going forward, the next three to five years, there's going to be even more openings and more opportunities out there, but also more challenges for, uh, for those employers looking to hire in the state. So let's talk about how we solve that. So we want to put more men and women at work here in the state of Wisconsin, not just putting them at work, but add more to the pool of people we can put to work to help our employers in the state of Wisconsin. 
So three key things. If you look out there, I'm going to talk, take a second to talk about each of these. One, we want to increase worker training and all the things that are part of it. Education, training, the whole gamut. I'm going to break this down in a moment and go through it with you as well. Secondly, we want to remove barriers to work. Now, we think there are things that stand in the way of getting people into the workforce, and so that helps us grow not organically, but, but in ways that are somewhat non-traditional. And then finally, we want to talk, I want to give you a preview of something we're announcing today, but then I'm going to have Tricia Brown, who's our, our great uh, uh, leader at the, along with Mark Hogan at the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. At the tail end, Tricia's going to give you the, the details. She knows the specifics as to what's going into this latest proposal we're going to lay out here today. I'm going to give you a tease. You know, it's kind of like we'd say in entertainment. We're going to give you a tease of what's coming. So make sure you stick around for that detailed presentation. But we're going to talk about how to attract and retain new talent uh, to every region across the state of Wisconsin. Not just to help Foxconn uh, with the exciting opportunity in Racine County, but to help employers from one end of the state to the other. So let's talk a little bit about first, how do we increase worker training? Well, one of the first things we're doing is investing into K through 12 education. That is the fundamental building block. And as we held a, a year ago, we held listening sessions in every one of our 72 counties. I heard it not only from teachers and superintendents and school board members, I heard it from small business owners. I heard it from employers who said, you need to start, we need to make significant investments, not only overall, so one, the budget we just signed, we put the most actual dollar invest, the highest actual dollar investment in the history of the state. Eleven and a half billion dollars we invested in the K through 12 education here in the state of Wisconsin. But we took it further than that. We didn't just put it uh, generically into our schools across the state. We also added some additional elements. So if you look as, as part of that, <coughs> we doubled the amount of resources available for fab labs. We, we invested more in the youth apprenticeships. In the last six years, they've more than doubled as well, which is a huge advantage. And uh, any of you here who are part of youth apprenticeships in your community, I hope you can vouch for this. Others who are not, take a look at that because there's tremendous opportunities. And with Ray Allen and his team at the Department of Workforce Development, we're working aggressively to get youth apprenticeships in every part of the state of Wisconsin because they're, they're just great opportunities along with internships uh, in some of the other uh, professions as well. They're just a great opportunity to get young people vested and interested in your employer and that's all the more reason that we can keep them here in the state of Wisconsin once they finish their training and or education. Uh, we also changed the way we used to have dual enrollment and, and college uh, uh, credit courses. We just call it now early college credit. Uh, we're giving our young people in high school an opportunity to get early college credit so that whether they go to one of our great technical colleges, where they go to the University of Wisconsin, one of our campuses there, whether they go to a private college or university, we're giving them an opportunity in many cases to get as much as a semester or even a full year's worth of credits before they even leave high school. That's a winner all the way around. H having had just two sons who are both now out of college, but, but recently Matt graduated a year ago, Alex graduated this May. Uh, people often ask me what it's like to be an empty nester. I said better than an empty nester, they're off the payroll. They're both working, which is really exciting. But when I think about people talking about the cost of college, be it public or private, one of the best ways to lower that cost is to reduce the amount of time that you've got to be enrolled. And so if we're giving students an opportunity to get early college credit, it's great for the students and families. It's great for taxpayers because that's less time we have to help uh, contribute as part of that, whether it's in our, our technical colleges, our UW system, or with some of the assistance we provide for private colleges and universities. And it's equally as important for all of you as employers because that's the sooner you get them uh, into the system where you can, you can reach out and employ them to, to be a part of your system. So a lot of exciting things happening there. We want to continue to do that. Uh, we're thrilled uh, with the great partnership and the additional funding I think will go a long way. In addition, uh, we want to continue to expand our opportunities for technical colleges. Uh, a few years ago, we did the Blueprint for Prosperity, which put about 5,000 more spots, 5,000 more students uh, were filled into key spots in, uh, in uh, technical colleges all across the state. Uh, you, remember, you might remember at the time, we didn't give that just, we didn't divide it up equally. We said to our technical colleges, you tell us what your demands are, we'll score it based upon uh, not only the programs you have to offer, but how they match the needs uh, within your particular technical college district region. And that they responded, they did exceptionally well. It was a huge thrust. We were pleased to see that. And we've now put additional dollars in. In fact, in this budget, we made the highest 
actual dollar investment again into our technical colleges ever before. We put an additional $5 million in the budget to allow them to accelerate in high demand areas. And in the legislation that was just passed a month or two back uh, that went through the Assembly and the Senate about Foxconn providing the enabling legislation, uh, the State Assembly and State Senate set aside about $20 million for workforce development the lion's share of that which is going to go into the technical college system again to try and help meet those high demand professions that are out there. So we're excited about that. They're key partners in all of our developments, whether it's the 13,000 jobs at Foxconn or 13 jobs we might have somewhere else uh, in a small business across the state. Our technical colleges are key partners and, and that's why we've made those investments. In addition, we want to strengthen the bonds we have between the University of Wisconsin system and our workforce. And so in this budget, uh, we did a number of things. We invested about $100 million more into the UW system itself. Uh, we put a, additional uh, criteria in to work with our regents within the UW system uh, to, to tie a portion of that money into performance. And really one of the key factors being is how do our campuses across the state, how are they relating to the demands that employers in that region have? Because we found, particularly if you look at our outside of where we're at here in Madison, which obviously the Big Ten is is known globally in that. We've got great schools everywhere, and, and UW Milwaukee's got uh, additionally a larger research focus. But you look at our individual campuses all across the state. One of our great opportunities uh, for employment are attracting students out of those campuses, and so we want to strengthen that partnership. We want to strengthen that link. I know for our regional economic development efforts, uh, our UW system campuses play an integral part in that along with our technical colleges. Again, that's why we put additional resources and that additional uh, partnership with the regents to try and tie in some of that additional money uh, into making sure it's meeting workforce needs. Uh, not to be left out as well, in addition to the great University of Wisconsin system, we have fabulous private colleges and universities in the state. And so much as we, we had done, and I did fail to mention this in the last slide, but we, we also froze for the sixth year in a row uh, tuition at all UW campuses to try and make uh, our schools more affordable for not only college students, but in many cases the working families that support them. In addition, for our private colleges and universities, uh, we increased needs-based financial assistance to the highest level ever. So that whether our students want to go, whether it's it could be Marquette University, it could be Beloit College, it could be St. Norbert's, it could be anywhere, or, or maybe they want to go to the, one of the UW campuses. We want to make sure that for those who come out of families with economic challenges, uh, that that isn't a barrier uh, to getting into uh, the college or university of their choice, with the hope being that we're making a pretty compelling state, or compelling, excuse me, pretty compelling argument that they should stay uh, right here in the state of Wisconsin. And then we've done a, a couple other things as well. We, I mentioned youth apprenticeships have more than doubled. We, we've also seen, again, we're, we're working actively to encourage registered apprenticeships. We have about 10,000 in the state of Wisconsin right now. We'd like to see that grow. We've got a number of employers who take advantage of that. Uh, in many cases, sometimes taking advantage of the youth apprenticeships and then seeing that through to a full-scale registered apprenticeships. Others just go directly into that. Those are all integral parts of our workforce development. And then uh, the Fast Forward program. A few years ago, we put that in a, a special session I called on workforce. In this budget, we increased the amount of funding we put into Wisconsin Fast Forward, which is customized worker training, 40%. Why? Because in addition to our apprenticeships, our technical colleges, our colleges and universities across the state, we knew in many cases, a lot of our employers said, that's great, but I need people now. I can't wait. Uh, for a certificate, I can't wait two years for an associate degree, I can't wait three or four years uh, for an undergraduate degree, I can't wait longer, I need people now. And so Wisconsin Fast Forward has gone into a series of different categories, certainly manufacturing, but in healthcare, uh, some of the young women you see there were up in, uh, if I remember right, I think that's up in Altoona, uh, in the Chippewa Valley, where we made an announcement about expanding opportunities in healthcare, whether it's certified nursing assistants or others. There's just a whole bunch of areas we need to focus in on. And so, again, our Department of Workforce Development wants to partner with employers and regions and territories uh, to get out front and address this issue, and we put more resources in that. So all of those in that first category, uh, step one, are just traditional. They're, they're kind of traditional, internal, organic growth that we have, but we need to double down on those areas because we can't afford to have anybody slip through and, and not get the training and education they need to fill the spots we have, not just today, 
but the spots we're going to have next year and the year after and the year after. But that's not enough. And so the next step is how do we remove some of the barriers uh, to employment here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so a couple key things when it comes to what we traditionally call welfare reform. Uh, first off, uh, this is something that I'm surprised it took us this long to, to, to do, but in the last year or so, I would hear from so many small business owners who would tell me, one of my challenges, is I, I have these really good employees working for me, but they're, they're not willing to take a promotion or not willing to take more hours because they're afraid of losing their benefits. We call them benefit cliffs. And so what we've done is changed that. Uh, it, we did some of this within the state. Some of it we needed some help from the federal government to do. But I'll give you a good example. One of the most frequent ones we'd hear about is, is a parent who had, maybe didn't have other public assistance, but had child care assistance. And, and say that mom said, well, I, if I get to 200% of poverty, that's what, well, they didn't really say that. They'd say the dollar amount, because they knew what the dollar amount. But say you get to 200% of poverty, they would lose all their benefits if they made a penny more than that. It's pretty logical to assume then that even people who want to work, who want to advance, who want to do better, why would you risk losing all that assistance, particularly if you've got kids and responsibilities and things like that going on? So, so now, what we've done since the budget is say going forward, instead of hitting a cliff where you fall off, uh, you ultimately going forward, an example of child care, you pay $3 more above that level. For, or for every $3 you make, I should say, you pay a dollar more in copay for your child care. Pretty simple. Well, now that's a huge incentive for people who previously were, were kind of leveled off and couldn't go above that dollar amount, now are able to enter the workforce. And as they enter the workforce, others can fill the spots that they have along the way. So one part was just simple things like eliminating the benefit cliffs. Another part is for those who are able to work. So for able-bodied adults, I used to say for those willing and interested in working, I don't say it anymore, for able-bodied adults, because whether you want to work or not, if you're an able-bodied adult, the rule now is you have to work at least 80 hours a month and or be enrolled in employability training for the same amount of time or a combination of both. The idea being is we know there's work out there. We just know it. We hear about it all the time, but statistically, empirically, we can see it just in our website alone how many jobs are out there. So if somebody is between 19 and 64 and they're physically and intellectually capable of working, we're going to get them in the workforce and they're going to have a requirement out there. I remember we first talked about this, there were some in the Capitol who said, oh my gosh, he's making it harder to get government assistance. I said, no, I'm not. I'm making it easier to get a job. That's what this is all about. And it ties in with the next one as well. We, we found, I talk to employers all the time who, who say, many of you here would say to me as well, two things. Give me people with basic employability skills. I mean soft skills. I don't mean a welder, machinist, fabricator. I mean somebody who can show up for work every day, who works a full week, who asks for time off, who does all the right things, who, who can actually follow the rules, and who can pass a drug test. We'll do the rest. We'll do the training. We'll do all these other things. Just give us bodies that can do those things. And so for public assistance, that's what we tied in with both of these things. We said, we want basic employability skills and a requirement that you're going to, if you can work, you're going to have to work and or be trained to work. And you got to be able to pass a drug test. And lo and behold, it's not punitive for us. It's simple. If someone fails to be able to pass that drug test, we set money aside for rehabilitation. Because we know if people are healthy and clean, we can find a job for anyone in the state of Wisconsin. It's just fundamentally so. I, I've said this for years, but it's just so true. We're good and decent people in this state. We'll help our neighbor when they're down and out, but if they're able, we expect that they work. We simply believe that public assistance should be more like a trampoline and less like a hammock. And so this will help us get more people into the workforce because I've heard it for years and this is the way we've got to crack down and, and get some results on this because the most frustrating thing is not people complaining just as taxpayers, but as employers saying, I got work. But it just drives me crazy that there are people I know either aren't able to take a better job or more hours because of those cliffs or are not willing to because of the way the system is set up. This adjusts on both of those. So then a couple other areas that go as well to removing barriers. Part of it is uh, we want to make sure that for all of our returning veterans, particularly here in the state of Wisconsin, that's typically members of the National Guard and the Reserves. For those who left from a job uh, by law, legally they're obligated to be able to have a job when they're, when they're returning. But some, particularly those who might be in the Guard Reserves if they're in school or that, as they come back, we want to help them meet their, their post-military career goals. 
And so one of the things I'm particularly proud of is we, we fully restored the Wisconsin GI Bill. We have, you can help us with this, this ties into something I'm going to mention at the end. Uh, you can help us spread this message because if you know veterans in your community, uh, we are the best state in America when it comes to veterans benefits. Out of the 26 benefits that veterans are eligible for, we provide 23 of the 26. No other state is close to us. We are the best state for military benefits in America. And that should be a pretty compelling argument for people who want to get into the workforce. Whether it's through training with the Wisconsin GI Bill, whether it's through other assistance to get into the workforce, whether it's people starting up their own business, we just think there's a tremendous opportunity to make the case to our veterans. And we think for each of you here, looking to hire a tremendous case to hire a veteran, not, not only because it's patriotic, but because they're well-trained, well-disciplined, well-focused. Oh, no, yeah, by the way, if you want them to go back to school, they can do it for free. They, their dependents, uh, and, uh, and their spouses uh, for eight, up to eight semesters. So it's a pretty good deal overall. Then a couple other things in terms of removing barriers. I, I mentioned this to many of you here before, but I want to expound on this as well. And we think that there's a tremendous opportunity to hire more people with both intellectual and physical disabilities. Uh, we have found uh, for those who participate in our Better Bottom Line initiative, uh, the feedback from employers is, is over the top. Employers said we thought we were doing this to do a good thing. It's actually been a great thing for us. Uh, they've been some of our most loyal, most responsive employees. Oftentimes all it takes is a slight adaptation, whether in an intellectual or a physical disability. And, uh, and we've done help along the way. When, the, the person who's there, the graduate there, is part of a program called Project Search. We came in, there were three sites in Wisconsin. By the end of the school year, there'll be 27 sites across the state of Wisconsin. That program alone, it's a national program, nationally it has just over 70% success rate. Here in the state of Wisconsin, it has an 88% success rate. 88% of the graduates within a year are fully employed, or employed uh, within the years they were seeking to. And so it's an area that they get a year-long program Sometimes it, is, it started out, a lot of them were hospitals, but it's other places as well now uh, where they get soft skill training and training about employability and handle how to handle certain sit, uh, situations. Tremendously successful. We want to continue to see it grow, both through that and through our Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Again, if you're looking to hire, those are areas we can work with you on in addition to helping with military personnel and, and apprenticeships and others because there's tremendous opportunities and it just, to me, one of the things I love, not only graduations, but going to visit some of our graduates in the workforce, is to see the pride. The pride that they have, that, that, that they have independence, that they'll tell me about. Uh, one of the things I remember, I was at a, a cheese factory uh, up in Marathon County, visiting with a few folks who'd, who'd been through these programs. And uh, you know, I was asking what they liked most. They said, well, they love the job, but they love the fact that they have their own apartment. They got a cat and a dog that they're able to care for themselves. Um, and that all came because someone believed in them enough to give them an opportunity to be employed. And the employer there told me these are some of their best employees. They're always early, always willing to work extra hard, always focused. These are just tremendous opportunities we've got to build off them. And then again, another one of those non-traditional areas, but, but we're doing more training in the vocational areas in our correctional facilities. Uh, the gentleman in the picture there are actually in the dairy program, um, for which there's a great need uh, for employees within our dairy farms across the state of Wisconsin. But, but we've particularly grown not only in that area, but uh, in some of the key manufacturing related vocations. Uh, we put a huge increase in this last budget. And again, it's just because of demand. We know there's a tremendous demand and it's a win-win because if we get people trained to enter the workforce, what's in manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, not only do we help employers, but statistically, we just know if someone has a good paying job because of the skills they developed as they're about to depart our correctional facilities, their chances of coming back are pretty slim. And so it's a win all the way around. So the final part, uh, the final step here is again, a little bit of the preview. Trisha's gonna tell you a little bit more in detail kind of some of the science and specifics behind this. But we understand that, that just the traditional first step I mentioned about training and education, that's great, but that's not gonna be enough. Just this kind of the second step I talked about, which is about removing barriers and kind of looking at some of the non-traditional ways to grow the workforce is great, but that isn't enough either. And so this third part we want to tell you about today is, is simply we need to go beyond our borders to attract and then in turn retain more talent here in the state of Wisconsin. So it really uh, falls into three pillars there as well. 
And the, the first thing overall before we get in those pillars is we're going to do uh, a national marketing and, and uh, advertising campaign to grow the workforce here in the state of Wisconsin. Now, this is something that I think many of you I've talked to in terms of employers have been craving for. Say so all these traditional ways, even some of these non-traditional ways are great, but we still need more bodies. In. And Bob, this is something we talked about earlier this year, saying that with Foxconn coming in, I mean, I, my passion with this is that it's great. I'm excited and I'm excited with Haribo and all the other employers that are coming in from around the world, not just around the country. And that's dynamic and exciting, but we've got to now harness that excitement Instead of just bringing more employers in, which obviously will gladly take more employers, we got to use that excitement to bring in more employees, more potential people in our workforce here in the state of Wisconsin. And so it's not enough to just give speeches and talks. We've got to put a whole campaign behind this, uh, both uh, earned and paid media along the way. And again, we'll get into some specifics, but I, I want to highlight a little bit about what we're thinking about with these pillars. Uh, so the first part is targeting Midwest millennials. And Trish will get into some of the specifics, but as you can imagine, we think about just down the way in Chicago, there's a number of really compelling reasons to be in the state of Wisconsin. One is you can just see in that, that visual, I love some of the, the concepts they've already set up. You know, look at the difference for the same amount of money what you can get in one spot versus the other. I mean, the cost of housing and the quality of housing is pretty compelling. And, and what we found in some of the research done, and it's, it's this great, this overall campaign is a combination of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development, and TravelWisconsin.com, which is our, our Department of Tourism. And tourism, you may or may not know this, has done a fabulous job over the years of going into the Chicago market and the Twin Cities and elsewhere. And we've seen about a 35% increase in tourism uh, since 2011. Because they've really done a good job of penetrating these markets. We want the same thing when it comes to talent. So we, we merged these three state agencies together uh, when it came to this campaign and said, you can help us out. And so these are similar in concept to some of the things we do when it comes to tourism in those markets. But this is a good example of thinking about making the case, whether it's digitally and advertisement otherwise, making the case to the folks in the Chicago area, hey, if you want to have a great home, you want to have it for a reasonable cost, you want to have all these other exciting things. It's interesting in some of the, some of the research, uh, you find, you know, in some of the probatums, even comments about people just thinking, oh, there were farms here. We love farms, uh, but there's a whole lot more to Wisconsin than that, and, and particularly from some of the exciting things that millennials are looking forward to uh, or want to be a part of. We've got them in abundance here in the state of Wisconsin. Another good example is uh, you think about this whole uh, work-life balance out there that, that we hear a lot of research about millennials talking about that it's not enough to just have a job and a home, but they want to have some balance in life. Well, part of that is we can make a pretty compelling case about the differential between actually doing things in Wisconsin, out canoeing or enjoying a concert or having a drink with friends as opposed to being stuck in commuting time uh, to and from work along the way, that we've got some solid data that Trish will talk about here as well uh, that really is, uh, I think, very forceful behind this overall campaign. So. That's one part of it. The second part, which actually kind of overlaps, is going after alumni from the state of Wisconsin. Certainly those from the University of Wisconsin system, but also from our private colleges and universities. We think there's a tremendous pool. And again, if you look at the data, no shock, a lot of our data, or a lot of our, our alumni, I should say, end up focusing um, in, in the short time after they graduate in places like Chicago or the Twin Cities. And a right time for us is often four to five years after they graduate. When they've got the excitement, they love the big city, love the big job, and suddenly they're getting more serious about thinking about family someday, where they're going to settle down, what all that is going to cost, boom. That's a great time for us. So some of these messages with the first two pillars kind of overlap depending on who we're attracting. Millennials, certainly in that first instance, often many of those also being our alumni, although our targeting alumni isn't limited to age along the way. <coughs> but we think there's a real compelling case, and I kind of like, again, the little mock-up of the ad there between do you want to be all alone standing out or do you want to be amongst family, uh, whether it's in Camp Randa or anywhere else uh, across the state of Wisconsin. And then the third big thing ties into what I talked before, and that is transitioning veterans and families. For us, this is just a critically important area because when I mentioned before that we have the largest amount, the largest number of benefits of any state in the nation for veterans. That's great for taking care of our veterans here today. And we're proud of that. But there's no reason why we need to keep it a secret. 
because you see those benefits apply to people who don't live in Wisconsin today, but we want to live here. And so one of the things we realized as we were looking at this is we haven't done enough to tell veterans elsewhere about what's available in the state. When you think about the Wisconsin GI Bill alone, if someone thinks about not only getting an education for themselves and their spouse, but for their kids, that alone's a pretty compelling argument. And then you look at things like the tax and military pensions and, and all the other benefits we have, and you add to that the fact that for a lot of our veterans, particularly those who've been on active duty for a fixed amount of time, they probably made uh, a choice in the past about where to list their residence based upon taxes. So they might be in Texas or Alaska, other places. Well, now if they have a military pension, we don't tax that here in the state. We haven't for years. Then you add in all these other benefits. And oh, by the way, we have tens of thousands of job openings um, in really exciting and dynamic careers from one end of the state to the other. There's a pretty compelling case for people who probably have moved around multiple times in their lives with themselves and their families, that moving one more time to a state like Wisconsin, where the cost of living is very attractive, where the education system is attractive, where they can get higher education without cost onto it, where they have all these benefits, in fact, more benefits than any other state in the nation. And as employers, I gotta hope and think that you, you would want to hire these sorts of employees because these are people who are well-trained, well-disciplined, well-focused, who've got tremendous skills and ability. This is a prime market for us. And so we're gonna put major dollars behind going out and making that appeal to bring more veterans and their families, particularly those transitioning out of their service in the military into the state of Wisconsin to be a part of the workforce. And we think, particularly with Foxconn alone, that you're talking about thousands and thousands of employees there, but we think it's not limited, that it won't be just for Foxconn. We think uh, from a big employer like that to someone, a small business with five employees who's looking for someone new, we think in each of those instances we can help not only with veterans, but with looking at our alumni coming back and with looking at the, uh, ultimately looking at the, uh, at, at millennials. So uh, that's a little bit of the last part there. The last thing I'll just end with on this is to tell you, overall, to do this, um, we've been investing some of this in those agencies I mentioned all along the way, but we're gonna, it's gonna take a little bit more, because that's not just something that can be encompassed in the existing budgets that they have. They, they do some of these elements, and that's why they're able to tee this up so uh, effectively. But to do that, it's gonna take some more resources. So today, what I'm announcing, and Trish will talk some more of the details here, but what I'm announcing with you here today is that we're asking the legislature to pass legislation yet this session uh, that will uh, allow, uh, in total, a package of $6.8 million that we'll spend to use on marketing in these three pillar areas I talked about um, for bringing more employees to add to the workforce here in the state of Wisconsin. So we thought of any place out here talking about the future of this state, workforce is so critically important out here that we wanted to you know it was more than just giving a rah-rah speech and more than just a little bit of an update. As you know, I, only every once in a while do I, I use a PowerPoint, but I thought today, because for so many of you, workforce is not just important now, but it's an important part of making decisions about where your employment is going to be in the future, where your investment in the state is going to be in the future, and who might else you might attract to be here in the state of Wisconsin, that we wanted to make the case to you that we have a comprehensive plan uh, that's ready to go, and this last part is new, but we think it's worthy in, in, in uh, relation to where we stand today and how many opportunities there are, not just to bring new companies into the state of Wisconsin, but how many of our existing employers want to add more people and how we can give you the confidence that as you do, if you make that decision, we're gonna help make sure you have the talent and the workforce you need to fill all of that. So uh, I'll hope, uh, I'll give you one personal bit of homework on the way out. If you get a chance uh, you know, between now and say Christmas, it's not a bad time, everybody's in a good mood, contact your state senator, contact your state representative, tell them passing something like this. And, and you don't have to limit it to one part or the other, this should be a nonpartisan issue Building our workforce should be something that's pretty easy for Republicans and Democrats alike to go along and, and do, and it, it augments all the other good things we've talked about that we've already invested in. But this would just be one more big step to going beyond just our traditional ways or even our non-traditional ways within the state to going outside of our state's boundaries to bring more talent into the state of Wisconsin. So with that, thanks very much, not just for listening today, but thanks as we close. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you who are employers and those who work with employers. Uh, thank you for all that you do. We, we wouldn't be at a point where there's more people in the labor force today than ever before if we didn't have great employers 
If we didn't have great educational institutions and nonprofits helping us along the way. So thanks to everybody here. Let's keep moving Wisconsin forward.